As a short introduction, my name is Martin Levert. I am the executive vice president for our cable and digital media business. I joined Millicom around two years ago, but I've been within the media sector for the past 17 years. 12 of those was with the European media company Modern Times Group, where I ran the pay TV business, including cable TV, satellite TV, IPTV, and some online businesses as well. You now heard Mario talk about our mobile business in Latin America. And I will now focus on our cable and digital media business that we currently have in Latin America. I will also touch up on some of our more recent initiatives within satellite pay TV distribution as well as content distribution and put that in context. Before we get started, there are some key points I would like to highlight about the business area and the region in which we operate. First of all, today, cable and digital media is one of the fastest growing areas within Millicom, with more than 20% year-on-year growth. It is also easy to forget that even though we are not operating in the largest countries in Latin America, our markets are vast, with more than 100 million people. Coming myself from Scandinavia, I used to think that 15 million people was a sizable opportunity. Millicom is a completely different animal here, with a great opportunity. Also, let's remember that our markets are, to some extent, where Europe and North America was 10 to 15 years ago when it comes to pay TV and uh, broadband. So there are good opportunities for continued growth, growth that I think will be sustainable and profitable. So all in all, I would say that we are in a very strong position, and we stand by our guidance of building a $2 billion business by 2017. So, to put our story a bit into context, and so you understand why we believe investing into these markets and how we will achieve our ambitious target. We entered into the cable business fairly recently, in 2008, early 2009, through the acquisition of Amnet. It was a very small cable operator in Central America, only existing in three countries, Costa Rica, Honduras, and El Salvador. When we got the business and controlled it, we started to quickly grow it, and we expanded the footprint into new markets. And over the years, we have had a consistent growth, strong growth, on average 23% per year. And not only did we grow the business by entering into new territories and adding on new subscribers, we have also changed the product mix. What previously used to be primarily a simple analog cable business is today something different, where we are providing much more services to our customers driving multi-play uh, uptake, double-play, triple-play customers when they buy digital TV and fixed broadband access. Uh, we have primarily grown our business organically, but we have also made some acquisitions over the years. Uh, in 2012, we acquired a leading Paraguayan cable operator, Cable Vision. In 2013, we followed up uh, buying the company Multivision in Bolivia. And we have been busy over the last one and a half year in Guatemala, consolidating the market. So what not started long ago is actually today, with the merger with UNE, the seventh largest pay TV and broadband operation in Latin America. Including UNE, our cable network today passes more than 5.5 million households, and we have more than 4.5 million RUUs. Our ambition is to be the leading provider in our markets, and as you can see, we are already having the number one or number two position in most of the markets where we operate. So it started as a simple and small-scale cable operation in only two of the countries where we have mobile operation. is today a fully integrated communication business across our Latin American countries. Uh, I said that we are on track to meet our $2 billion target. And the reason why I believe into this is that we are delivering a very strong organic growth. We see further opportunities for in-market consolidations and acquisitions, but we will continue to look at this opportunistically, like we have done in the past. We also believe that our more recent strategic initiatives, satellite pay TV and content distribution, will yield returns in the years to come. And not least, we are about to get going on the journey together with UNE in Colombia. Last year, we gave you a revenue guidance of 1.8 to 2.6 billion US dollars. That target included UNE's B2B and mobile operations. If you remove those two components, 
our $2 billion target is actually on the higher end of last year's forecast. So all in all, including UNE, I would say that we have already realized around 60% of our ambitious target, and we still have more than three years to go. So why do we believe so strongly in cable? There are three simple reasons behind this, or three main reasons. First of all, there is a strong underlying market growth driven by an increasing uptake of pay TV and broadband. Secondly, there's a good strategic fit operating a mobile and a fixed business. It gives us a more complete product portfolio, which we know is attractive to consumers. It will drive multiplayer uptake and it will also increase stickiness. Clearly, there are also synergies that we can take advantage of, but I will revert to those within shortly. And finally, I think our performance to date speaks for our strategy and that it is working, and we have an appetite to do more in that area. So let's look at the underlying market growth opportunity. Simply put, uh, there is very little cable rolled out in our markets. Consumers, even if they want pay TV in a fixed broadband, simply cannot get it to a large extent. And obviously, the resulting penetration levels are low. In some countries, as low as 6 to 10%. In many European countries, penetration levels would be close or even above 90% for both pay TV and fixed broadband access. There is no reason why our market should be different and penetration levels lower than in neighboring countries in the region in Latin America. And I would also like to say that our own experience tells us that when we roll out our own network into new neighborhoods, offering quality services at affordable prices, consumer demand quickly follows. The second reason was the good strategic fit, uh, operating a fixed and a mobile uh, business. So from a sales perspective, this gives us an opportunity to cross-sell and bundle, and you will hear more about that during the day. We can also share the sales and distribution network. And I think we can say that we would like to say that we have almost as many points of presence in our market as Coca-Cola has outlets for their products. This gives us an unrivaled local presence in the market. It's hard to match for any standalone operator. The local presence is also a great advantage now when we are rolling out our own satellite pay TV platform in rural areas. The same goes with MFS, which provides a solution for handling payments in remote areas. On the cost side, we also have synergies. Uh, we can share a lot on the network side between a fixed and a mobile operation. A mobile operation also relies on a fixed network to feed the antenna towers. The combined size also gives us scale when we acquire and purchase things, for example, internet access. I'm sure you want me to give you a number of the synergy potential. It is hard to give an exact number because it will vary from case to case. But to give you some form of indication, a conservative estimate of the cost synergies from our Paraguayan cable acquisition, cable vision, is around 20% of the enterprise value. So I told you that the performance to date is strong and our strategy seems to be working. But a strategy is nothing more than words and papers without execution. And I think both Mario and Hans Holger touched up on that, but we believe that one of our strengths is excellent execution. And for this business area, our approach has four cornerstones. First, we build out our infrastructure, simply rolling out our own network into new neighborhoods, doing in-market consolidation and acquisitions where so suitable. The aim is simply to pass as many households as possible. Next, we make sure that we connect people to our network, that they are starting to buy our services, digital TV, analog TV, broadband, and so on. Then we move outside the urban areas where we are focusing on cable, tapping into a large rural population. And finally, we create and we communicate consumer value. So rather than focus on price, we focus on what matters to consumers. And our consumers, they want to feel that they have the world at their fingertips. Like all of us here, they want to feel that they are entertained, enlightened, and connected, all at an affordable price. So how does our execution actually look in reality? In 2014, we expect to roll out our, house, uh, our cable network to pass more than 400,000 more homes passed. Majority of that rollout will be in our less developed markets, Bolivia, Paraguay, and Guatemala. Once we expand the network into new neighbors, we start with zero customers. 
Uh, but as soon as we roll it out, our sales job starts. The good thing in our case is that even though we have had a very aggressive and rapid rollout of our network, the uh, penetration or connection ratios have remained fairly stable, indicating that we are not only go good in building and rolling out the network, but we are also good in selling and connecting customers. During this very aggressive rollout phase, we have also been able to increase the number of services sold per household, as well as the penetration levels of both digital TV and broadband access. So what about the economics of cable? We expect less than four years payback for a connected cable home. I think you will find that that is significantly less than what would you find in North America and Europe, including, including Eastern Europe. And I think the simple reason why we can achieve this is that we operate with a fairly low cost structure and we have very high connection ratios. Not only can we grow our business by rolling out our own network, we can also do in-market consolidations or acquisitions. Many of our markets you can characterize by being highly fragmented. Hundreds of small local analog cable operators who are very unlikely to be able to provide the type of services that their customers would demand in the near future, such as fast broadband access. I think Guatemala is a very good example uh, where we started our operation only 18 months ago. Today, we are the number two operator in Guatemala, actually the number one cable operator in Guatemala. And we have achieved that through a series of in-market consolidations, as well as combining that with rolling out our own network. Is there room for more in-market consolidation acquisition? Yes, for sure. But I would say that we will continue to look at this opportunistically, like we have done in the past. If something comes up, we look at it, and then we make up our mind. Talking about consolidation, we most recently completed the merger between our Colombian mobile operation and UNE's cable business in Colombia. UNE, it is a continuation of our existing cable strategy, but it's a fast track, you can say. It is a perfect fit for us. For those who do not know about UNE, it is the number two pay TV and broadband operator in Colombia. UNE has more than one million pay TV customers, another million broadband customers, and revenues in excess of one billion US dollar. This merger offers us a way to grow cable into a market where we had no presence to date. It also allows us to build scale in one of Latin America's largest and fastest growing markets. Uh, the combined entity will over time make us the number two telco operator in Colombia. And you will get much more details from Esteban, who will speak later during the day about UNE and Colombia. I've been speaking a lot about the cable part of our business. Uh, let's touch up on what we can do more. So we go now outside the urban areas, the city centers. We operate in countries where a relatively high percentage of the population live in what you can define as rural areas, areas where we never or not in the near future will roll out a cable network. Satellite pay TV, or also referred to as DTH, is actually normally the leading distribution platform for television around the world, especially in developing countries, but not so in our countries. Our countries are a bit different. So upside with DTH is it's just one high antenna. It's a satellite in the sky. So it's very quick to roll out. And you don't have to roll out the cable network. The downside would be that you cannot provide fixed broadband access. However, we think that satellite pay TV standalone is a really attractive opportunity for us in our markets. And it will be even more attractive over time when we start to bundle with our mobile broadband solutions. Taking all this into account is why we, during the year, have launched our own satellite pay TV platform. And as Hans Holger said, we rolled it out in five countries so far over five months. And having satellite pay TV as my living for the past uh, 15 years, I, I must say this is probably one, some form of world record. So we are proud of that. And I say that we have good traction in our markets, looking very promising. The final cornerstone uh, in our approach is, as I said, create consumer value. And Millicom is as much about providing value to consumers as it is to provide returns to you as shareholders. In my view, there are three simple ways to do and provide and create value in this sector. First, reliable and, e a 
reliable and ever faster broadband speeds, content relevance, and in terms of choice, and providing value-adding features. In terms of broadband, once customers in our markets get used to broadband, they will request faster and faster broadband speeds, like people have done in North America and Europe. I think as a cable operator, we are in a unique position to meet those demands for higher speeds. And unlike the incumbent copper network operators, we do not have any inherent technical limitations. So from a network side, we clearly have the upper hand. In terms of content, we today deliver more than 200 channels, the leading channels, to our customers in the territories, including all relevant local channels. We're also providing leading features. As an example, we have taken the number one position in our markets as the leading provider of HD content, offering more than 40, 80 channels to customers in our markets. Not only are we uh, delivering other people's channels and acting as an aggregator, we have also started to make our own television channels. Recently, we launched two channels in Latin America, Tigo Sports in Bolivia and Tigo Sports in Paraguay. These are two dedicated sport channels, providing a new and unique experience to customers in our markets, something that you would find normal and completely natural in some of the uh, European countries. But in these markets, there has simply been no products like this, and we are providing that. I also think it's important to say that now being an integrated cable and mobile operator, content is a natural extension for us. I think that content and entertainment will be main drivers for the adoption of the digital lifestyle. And the more content we can control, we can actually utilize that across our different platforms, cable, satellite, mobile, and future OTT platforms. I think we'll have some demonstrations in the back here later of those. So let me quickly show you how uh, Tigo Sports look like in our market. And to the extent possible, we try to deliver this exclusively on our platforms. We've got a teaser here of the content, and I can say that the content uh, is including the most highly desirable content in the markets. For example, both the local soccer leagues in Paraguay and in Bolivia as well as big international rights as the English Premier League. As a side note, I'm happy to say that today, Tigo Sport in Paraguay is actually the most viewed paid TV channel in that country. So the channel is clearly performing well. So what did I tell you at the last Capital Markets Day and what have we done since we met the last time? We said that we would achieve growth and we have delivered more than 20% year on year growth. We said that we would expand our network, and in 2014, we are building out our network with more than 400,000 homes. We have also entered into two new markets since we met, Bolivia and now Colombia. We said that we would get synergies between our cable and mobile business, and we have now integrated our Bolivian and Paraguayan cable assets into Melecom, and we have started to cross-sell and bundle between mobile and cable. We said we would do UNE, and that is clearly now done. And we should also do some new strategic initiatives. And I think we have that in the shape and form of satellite pay TV and our own pay TV channels. So all in all, I would say that we are on track to meet our $2 billion target. And I hope that I, through my presentation here today, have showed you that the fundamental growth opportunity in the market is there, and that we have the key building blocks in place. One more thing before I quit, or, or finish the, the speech. <laughs> I mean, we rebranded. Uh, Tigo Star is our new umbrella brand for all our media and content related initiatives. We hope this will help to elevate Tigo from being seen as a pure telecom provider to also be seen as the digital lifestyle company that brings a lot of more entertainment and enjoyment to its customers. Uh, let me now leave you with a teaser of the Tigo Star launch campaign that we have rolled out in our markets across Latin America. After that, coffee. Okay, so I want to give you, I want to give you some light in the tunnel. So coffee after Q&A. And we discuss this, well, let's bundle the questions a bit after session. Some questions maybe then we um, say we're going to answer in the afternoon or other sessions. But if there are any kind of follow-up questions uh, on the first presentations, please do so. If not, enjoy the coffee. Yeah, 
the mic is coming. Microphone there. Yeah, good morning. It's uh, Luigi Minerva from uh, HSBC. Uh, maybe a question for uh, uh, for Mario. I'm interested in the link between uh, data growth and data monetization. If you can give us some practical examples how you're delivering it, I presume there are differences depending to markets. Uh, sure. Thanks. I can uh, elaborate a little bit on that. Uh, well, the first basic uh, recipe for that is no unlimited plans. That's the first basic uh, step. And to do, we have never had any unlimited plans in our, in our businesses. And that is one key uh, important factor. Second is the discipline in pricing and in packaging. Uh, third is a very strong IT and, and network core uh, deployment. So it is not easy to do that. It is a rather complicated matter, but uh, it can be done. And, um, and as I say, at the same time, we can become more and more effect, uh, efficient. I remember from a couple of... Uh, it's on now. I remember from a couple of um, Capital Markets day ago, there was a slide where you were kind of showing that uh, the customers were redirected to the Tigo portal to uh, recharge as soon as they were reaching the, the limit. That continues. Is that still the case? Yes. How is that ev evolved? No, well, that's basically the same concept. And, and when you reach a certain, I mean, when you reach your data quota, then you have to reload. And another thing we did is that there is no on-demand data. So in order to, to navigate, in order to surf, or in order to use an app or anything, you actually need to reload. So there's basically, uh, it's clear that data is becoming a driver, is something desirable, and we shouldn't give it away. It's as simple as that. And we're gonna talk this afternoon a bit more when we have a digital panel about how we bundle what we see, that bundle creates value, so it's not value destructive. One question over there, Tim, and then we go there. Thank you, it's Eric Pers, Dunst Market. Um, I was curious about the, the cable presentation and um, I was wondering how much of investments in the next couple of years do you see going into cable and how much into DTH effectively? Um, also, as you've launched DTH in I think five countries this year, how much does that cost in European R, roughly? And, and finally, um, after the, out of the 185 USD per cost per home connected on DTH there. I was wondering, is, is, that what, is that Millicom's cost or is it the total cost and how much does the customer pay out of that? Thank you. Okay. I have to have the presentation here. But in terms of CapEx, I don't think we break out the CapEx for individual business areas. What I can say is that our investments in cable will, you can say, be self-financing. We said that last year, that I stand by now again. When it comes to the satellite pay TV business, as well as the cable, there is one important thing for you to consider as well. I would say a big portion of the investments that we are doing is actually not investments in network or servers and things like that. A large portion of the investments that we're doing is actually in, in consumer equipment, it's providing set-up boxes to consumers connecting their cost customers to our network. I think that's a good thing. It's a highly variable CapEx plan that we have in that sense. When it comes to the DTH plan, it is uh, not big investments. Uh, I think we said before that it's uh, single digit uh, uh, figures in million dollars. So not massive investments when it comes to rolling out a platform in satellite pay TV. It is uh, fairly straightforward. I think the upside there is that we have an existing distribution network, a local presence, and a very strong brand in the markets. I don't know, did that cover the question? Maybe to add one point, I think, which is, which is important as well, which, as Martin described in, in his presentation, if you look at the kind of services we're gonna offer in the digital lifestyle ecosystem in the future, we believe that entertainment will be the key, key driver. There's nothing more which creates a stickiness, more emotional, uh, kind of bond, uh, bonding uh, with the um, or bonding with the with the end consumer. Hence, what we've done in the cable sync uh, in the cable business is very beneficiary for for the mobile business. 
But if you want to compete on a national level, you have to go into the DTH side as well. You have to offer a kind of complete national-wide uh, solution, as, by the way, our competition is doing, if you look at Claro, for example, or as AT&T has figured out, for example, here in, uh, in the US. But I was amazed coming from the European side what cost a DTH platform. It's very uh, small incremental cost because you build it on the existing infrastructure. Just to clarify, did, did, does Millicom subsidize all of the boxes on yeah. cable and DTH? Yeah. Today we have a post-pay business in our uh, pay TV business, both cable and satellite. So we subsidize, uh, we make sure that we have low entry barriers for customers. However, what we have started to experiment with is also to have a prepaid business model. And that is we, exactly what we're doing now in Guatemala when we are rolling out our satellite platform there. So next year I will tell you how that has performed and what our key model is. But the upside is obviously that you don't subsidize the hardware for the customer to the same extent. But the prime is postpaid. Next question. Thank you. Good morning, Rodrigo Llanoa from Merrill Lynch. My question is related to uh, the numbers that you released on UNE. You're talking about uh, $550 million in revenues. Does that account for four and a half months? And could you please provide revenues and EBITDA? I would suggest that we, um, we handle this question maybe after the UNE presentation, which will follow straight after the, mm -hmm. um, the coffee. If you can bear with us for, for this yes. 45 minutes. Esteban will talk in detail about this, because this is one of the most relevant questions. And Tim also, from the finance point Tim of view, he will cover. Okay. Do you Thank want to try another much. question? Or? <laughs> that was, uh, was the one. There should be going over here. One more question there. And then maybe. Thanks. Nick Brown of Goldman Sachs. Uh, two questions, please. Firstly, do you think uh, the 9% revenue growth you're achieving at the moment is sustainable? Or as you try and stabilize margins, should we expect this to slow in the next few quarters? And secondly, you mentioned you may be interested in further in market cable consolidation. Um, would you consider anything of the kind of scale of UNE again in the near future? Thanks. No, let's start maybe with the last one. Uh, if you look at our portfolio currently, we're very happy. And all the targets we communicated are without any uh, additional major M&A transaction. We do continuously, like we have done in the past, very small cable consolidation in our existing markets um, in Latin America, but they are small in scale. If there's an opportunity, of course, for internal or in-market consolidation, we may have a look. But again, we do it very opportunistic. There's no pressure. There's no need. And we are very happy with the assets we have. On the bigger scale, there's no M&A activities in the, in the near future. Um, on the, I think the other question was about the EBDA um, profile. Huh? Yeah, revenue growth can be sustained with the, with the, with the kind of target we have. Um, there, is, there is no concern in that respect. And again, the process, of course, is, is much more solid nowadays as well because we have been you know, in execution mode for, for, for 18 months. Hence, uh, we feel even more comfortable. So the, the gap and the range we had uh, 18 months ago is, is narrowing, and we're adjusting some of the smaller things. But fundamentally, now we, 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 we believe the growth comes with the existing profile when it comes to cash and to, to EBDA. Thanks. I know you haven't given a target for MFS revenues in the next few years. Should we think of that as more of a tool to reduce churn? Yeah. No. It's, it's as I said in the beginning. It's it, which is which is the difficulty you have when you when you launch new business and and, and start up the business. Um, the the 600 million to a billion by 2017 looks optimistic today. It come probably later, um, but still it, it doesn't mean that we don't big believers in MFS. There's a revenue model behind it. It may be in the region around three to four hundred million by 2017. But even more important, it is a kind of a tool to reduce churn and increase ARPU. And certainly as well, which is I'm always saying when it comes to, to MFS, it's a gatekeeper function for all pay TV or paying services on the OTT side in the future. Because people don't have a credit card in our market, or there is no bank. So we, for example, are doing, as far as I know, those two guys working together, um, our, our Tigo Star DTH, or pay TV customers, paying the subscription with, uh, with Tigo money. money. And that's exactly the kind of model you see in, in those places. It's driving preference, by the way. Yeah. One more question, and then we. Then yeah. Should I start? Yeah, uh, Andreas Jules on SCB. Uh, question for uh, Martin. Uh, what kind of ARPU do you expect in cable overall? Quite easy question. Uh, and then for Mario, maybe overall, uh, consumers are going to spend more and more on mobile data, consume more and more on cable. Uh, so I guess share wallet will increase. And where do that money come from? What, what do you take from, so to say? Okay, Tim, do we disclose the ARPU? 
Good. <laughs> so I can say that we have um, the average ARPU today is around 30 US dollar per household. In some countries higher, in others lower, but that's the blended average. What do we plan for the future? We plan that ARPU will grow. You can grow ARPU in different ways. One way is to increase the price. Another is to make sure that people buy more services. And we're going to focus on the latter primarily. And that is why our ARPU has been growing over the years. If you have an analog cable sub, you upgrade him to digital TV, ARPU goes up. When you sell them broadband, it goes up, and so on. So I think our growth in the future will be propelled by two things, expanding the network, connecting more subscribers and households, but also changing the composition uh, of the product mix that we sell to customers. Okay? Yes, and uh, the data growth and where is the revenue coming from? What's the revenue model? It's important to understand that several factors contribute in this. Number one is the general microeconomic growth in, in the region. So that's why uh, we focus in, in, in the development markets. Second, the, um, the growing middle class will have more disposable income. And perhaps the most important is the uh, creation of the ecosystem around the consumer. So we have to, and we are embarked in this, to be able to sell and put the uh, smartphone uh, in the hands of the consumer, which we're doing. As I said, more than 70% of the phones we sell today are smartphones already. And not only that, but we have to make sure that they actually consume. And not only that, that they want to stay with us. So that's hence the importance of the experience and the ecosystems that I mentioned before. So those are basically, um, that's the dynamic that is into play in this sector. Next question. Hi. In the uh, LATAM mobile presentation, you talked about some OPEX um, efficiencies that you've identified without really quantifying them or going into any further details. Yeah. Is there anything more that you can share with us at this stage? I'm sure Tim can take that question in more detail uh, later on. Yes. We're going we're to come back to this in the afternoon session with Tim. Hi, uh, this is Sundar Vardarajan, PNP Fixed Income. Uh, just a question back on monetization of data. You talked about no unlimited data plans, but are there other aspects to that monetization as you add more and more service? For instance, you have Tigo Music, you know, do subscribers pay for that? Or, yeah. And as you kind of layer on more services, are there two components to it, or are you just going to derive it from increased data usage and therefore paying for higher data plans? To be quite honest, this is uh, an area of uh, expertise, it's an art, I would say. <laughs> so we cannot give you all of, of too many details there, but I can tell you that the main ingredients are, as we said before, no unlimited good experience for the customer, uh, having an integrated and you know, attractive ecosystem where people will be willing to pay for. And then there's a lot of uh, discipline into pricing and packaging. That's, those basically are, the, the, the key ingredients that I can tell you. And just one follow-up on, on Tigo Star. You said you've launched it in two markets. Are you able to roll it to other markets too, or do you have any uh, regulatory issues that you have to overcome no, to we, be able to? No, we rolled it out. Tigo Star is now being rolled out in all our markets. Uh, we do not do it in Colombia. There the brand is uh, Una Tigo, and, uh, <coughs> but in all the other markets, it is now called Tigo Star. Uh, 